Uh, the Case Western Reserve Law Review Symposium on Access to the Courts in the Roberts Era. Um, I'm here in part uh, because I'm Associate Dean for Academic Affairs, uh, and uh, uh, Dean Bob Rawson is out of town doing what deans are supposed to do. Um, I'm also the, uh, the advisor to the Law Review, um, and so I've had the privilege of spending the last few months working with the editors on putting this program together. Uh, and uh, I, I just want to take a second to, to note uh, two of the editors who are in the back, uh, Kelly Johnson, who is the symposium coordinator, uh, and uh, Kristen Marsteller, who is the editor-in-chief. Um, We're going to have a full day, um, and I'm delighted that we have uh, both such a, a, a terrific uh, co uh, collection of, of speakers uh, and uh, such a, uh, a good uh, uh, audience. Uh, the audience uh, is partly live in this room and partly joining us on the web, so over the course of the day uh, when things get opened up for discussion, uh, there will be mics uh, passed around. Please wait for the mics so that people who are joining us on the web uh, will be able to hear what's being said. Um, let me just make a couple of preliminary remarks and then we can, can uh, get started. Uh, we think about courts as fora for the resolution of disputes, um, as places where justice is done. But not everybody can get into court. Some people can't get into court at all. Uh, other people can't get into court at, a at some particular time. Uh, and uh, some people can't get into a particular court uh, because of various sorts of legal doctrines. We're going to spend the, uh, much of the day uh, talking about some of these issues uh, as they appear uh, in the early stages of the Chief Justiceship of John Roberts. Uh, this morning, uh, we will be talking about preemption. Uh, this afternoon, uh, we will be uh, talking about um, issues such as standing and alternative dispute resolution. Um, and in between, uh, we will hear uh, uh, from our keynote speaker, uh, Gene Nickel, from the University of North Carolina. Uh, I don't want to spend any more time uh, uh, or, uh, on uh, introductions. I think uh, we ought to move just uh, right away into our first panel, uh, which will be moderated by, uh, by uh, my former colleague and many of our good friends, uh, Bill Marshall, uh, so let's uh, have Bill uh, and the group come up, and you, Bill, you can introduce the, uh, your, your palace. First of all, it's great to be back at Case, and thanks to John, and thanks to the uh, editors of the Law Review for uh, allowing me to come back and moderate, moderate this panel. In front of water coolers and at cocktail parties all throughout the country, you don't really hear people talk about issues of presidential power or abortion or free speech, which you hear people talk about when they talk about major divisive political issues going to the Supreme Court of the day are federal preemption issues. <laughs> well, maybe not. But I just, served, uh, I just served as a Solicitor General of Ohio for a year, and the issue that we were dealing with most in front of the Supreme Court, whether it be directly or by amicus outside of death penalty litigation, were federal preemption issues. And federal preemption issues are, are really where the rubber is meeting the road in front of the United States Supreme Court right now, and creating a very surprising divide in a lot of cases. Conservatives, who you might think are very friendly to states' rights, have been very active in finding federal preemption, whereas liberals, who you might think would be very, very against states' rights, have been very active in fighting against 
federal preemption. And I think a lot of what we're going to hear this morning in this panel is exactly why this divide might be taking place in this manner. Certainly it is an issue of very, very strong importance to the states. Uh, the states uh, find themselves continually on the losing end of these cases for the most part over the last couple of years, although surprisingly the one case that has been decided this year, Altria versus Good, found that there was not federal preemption with respect to uh, tort liability from cigarette companies calling their cigarettes, uh, calling their cigarettes light. We have, I think, uh, we are lucky enough in this first panel to, I think, really have an all-star cast uh, of, uh, of academics presenting the issue, the issue to you. This is really a panel that I don't think could be, could be better replicated anywhere in terms of the quality and the vision it brings to this particular debate. And I'm not going to take a lot of time introducing the panelists, although I could spend the rest of the day doing it. Uh, but I'll just give you a quick little background on it. Roderick, Roderick Hills teaches at NYU, where he's the William T. Comfort Professor. Uh, he, is, he is a uh, graduate of Yale University, and he clerked for Justice Higginbotham. He claims to be an environmentalist, but he's written so much that half of the forests of the Northwest have been cut down just to support, <laughs> just to support his articles. Linda Mullinax, who is the Morrison Rita Atlas Chair at the University of Texas, basically invented, created, and is the key person in mass tort litigation uh, studies in the United States. She's absolutely, she's known, anybody who does any work in this area has to come across her work. She got her BA at City College in New York, her master's and PhD at Columbia, and her law degree from Georgetown. Catherine Sharkey uh, got, her, uh, got her degree, both undergraduate and law degree at Yale University. She clerked for Guido Calabresi and uh, Justice Souter. Uh, she has the honor, if you want to call it the honor, it depends on whether you like but sees or sees, of being cited by the United States Supreme Court on her federal preemption work. And uh, anybody who writes in this area has got to, got to, uh, got to uh, take her, her very important work into account. And finally, we have David Vladek, who teaches law at, at Georgetown University. David really comes from the trenches. For, for, for 30 years, he was the director of Public Citizen, perhaps the leading consumer group fighting fighting many of these issues on the front lines uh, for, uh, um, and usually against, although he'll, he will present his arguments against federal, against federal preemption. He, uh, he is a, um, a graduate of, um, of NYU and, uh, and also, I believe, got his LLM at Georgetown. So without any further ado, let me turn over to the panel. Our, the order that we're going to proceed in is we're going to go first with David, Linda, then, uh, then Roderick, and then Catherine. Uh, each of the panelists will be, will be given up to 15 minutes. We will then allow them to cross-question each other, and then we will open it up to questioning. So thank you very much. Thank you. I am not William Marshall. <laughs> and I can't use a computer, so <laughs> I'm going to get this out of the way. Uh, good morning. I want to thank the members of the Law Review and the faculty here for inviting me. Uh, I want to I want to put a footnote to Bill's introduction. One of my articles too was also so, cited by the Supreme Court, but un, unlike Catherine's, mine was cited by the single dissenting vote um, <laughs> in, in Regal. Uh, so she she's way ahead of me in terms of useful citations. So let me start by describing my thesis today, and then I'll explain why I believe this. Uh, my thesis is that conventional preemption analysis, the analysis that is routine uh, routinely applied by the court overlooks an important question, which is the possibility that state tort law itself actually serves an important goal in serving federal interests. That is, the objective set forth in the statute underlying the preemption claim, and the court's failure to take a hard look at whether state law actually further state, uh, federal goals uh, ends up subverting the accomplishment of federal statutory goals, and that this this failure by the courts has led, to the, has led to the invalidation of state law in situations where uh, permitting the state law to go forward would actually serve as an important market discipline which would help the accomplishments of federal law. And so uh, I'm going to make two arguments. One is that there are questions of agency competence to actually get the work done that Congress has assigned to it. And second, there are questions at times of agency capture. 
That is, the agency is not working fully uh, in the public's interest, but is working hand in glove with the, uh, with the industry the agency is supposed to regulate. Um, and, you know, I think that this is a problem in many respects, but in one sense, and I'm not going to talk about this much, but it creates a nightmare for Congress and for state and local governments because the imprecision and the overlapping natures of the court's uh, preemption jurisprudence leads to tremendous uncertainty, uh, making it very difficult for the agency, for the, for legislative bodies to address allocations of state and federal authority uh, in a sensible way. So I'm going to talk about agency competence uh, first, and I'm going to use as an illustration the facts underlying what is probably the most contentious case before the Supreme Court this term, a case called Wyeth versus Levine. Now let me just give you a quick thumbnail sketch of the facts of the case and then talk about questions of agency co uh, competence and capture. Um, uh, Ms. Levine uh, was a musician. Uh, she had migraine headaches. She went to her local medical clinic when she got a migraine and got a shot of Demerol uh, as well as uh, an administration of the dose of the drug Phenergan, which is an anti-nausea drug that helps combat the nausea that comes with a migraine headache and is a side effect of the Demerol. Didn't work very well. So a couple hours later, she went back to the clinic, got some more Demerol, and this time she had a dose of Phenergan that was actually injected. Now, it was supposed to be injected into her veins, and one of the things that I learned working on this case is it makes a huge difference whether a drug is injected into a vein or into an artery. Everyone knows that Phenergan is toxic to arteries. It causes them essentially to die. And so there are instructions on the label instructing physicians to be careful when, uh, when using Phenergan to make sure there's no arterial contact. Unfortunately, in Ms. Levine's case, the Phenergan came in contact with her artery, caused necrosis, forcing first the amputation of her hand, and then later the amputation of her arm just below her elbow. Uh, so now a flourishing musician has trouble maintaining her life, has lost her source of income, and she sued, and she sued uh, Wyeth, the manufacturer of Phenergan, for failing to warn physicians not to permit the intravenous uh, administration of this drug. So prior to 2002, it's quite clear that there would have been no successful preemption defense. Preemption, post-CHIP alone, post the Supreme Court's 1992 decision in, the, in, in its tobacco case, Prior to 1992, drug companies never interposed preemption to defense. Post-1992, they did, but by and large, they lost. Because unlike other statutes where Congress makes an explicit determination that there ought to be preemption of state law, the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act does not contain an express preemption provision for drugs. So from, from 1992, when these claims started to be made, through 2004, 2005, no appellate court in the United States, federal or state, had ever sustained a preemption defense interposed by a pharmaceutical company. Now we have a case in the Supreme Court raising exactly that question. So what happened? In 2002, the new administration decided that preemption was really appropriate. And I, I want to come back to the question of who decided this, this issue. But I want to start with the, the decisional process. The agency first started to announce its change in position in amicus briefs. It started filing amicus briefs on behalf of regulated parties, arguing in favor of broad preemption of tort litigation. Um, an odd way for an agency to announce a, a reversal of position that it had held for 70 years or so. Then in 2006, the agency published an important change in the way patient labeling takes place. <clears throat> I don't know whether you ever, anyone in this room has ever bothered to look at the label of a drug that he or she has been prescribed. But if you do, and if you have a good memory, you'll notice that in 2007, the formatting of the label changed. There's now a section called highlights 
smaller section that lists the, the most serious, ad, and serious and common adverse reactions to the drugs. And those are the, those are the adverse reactions people are supposed to be looking at. In addition, there are other warnings that are on the label, other indications for use, dosing instructions, and so forth. But the key change in the 2006 labeling rule was to talk about this highlight section. In the preamble to the rule, not in the rule itself, but in the preamble, there's a lengthy discussion of preemption. And the agency, for the first time in a formal setting, articulated its position that failure to warn claims based on the inadequate warning of the label were preempted not by an express preemption provision, there is none, but it were preempted by virtue of the tension the FDA said it exists between its control of labeling and any state toward judgment that might find the FDA approved label inadequate. Well, this sent a shockwave through the lower courts. What do you do with this FDA pronouncement? Does it, is it entitled to deference? If it's entitled to deference, what degree of deference? And so there were literally dozens and at one point probably 100 cases addressing those issues. I want to talk first about the competence question, and then I want to get to agency capture. One concern that was played out in the courts is whether the agency actually is competent to supervise and monitor post-approval all of the 11,000 drugs on the market uh, today. The FDA, like many federal agencies, uh, is terribly understaffed. The FDA regulates one quarter of every dollar you spend. Think about it. One quarter of every dollar you spend, the foods you buy, with the exception of meats, blood products, veterinarian products, drugs, medical devices, uh, imports, uh, so the ingredients in pharmaceuticals, almost none of which are made in the United States, are regulated by the FDA. Uh, border inspections of all the fruits and vegetables that we now import from around the world. The FDA has fewer than 9,000 people to regulate one quarter of the American economy. 1,000 people do drug safety work. And that includes everything from reviewing clinical trials to approving drugs uh, to worrying about uh, inspecting drug manufacturing facilities. Um, and so one concern voiced uh, not just by outsiders, and I'll come to this in a moment, but voiced by insiders, the FDA, is we can't possibly monitor the safety, let alone day-to-day -day monitoring of the label of every single drug in the United States. Moreover, the FDA is, is supposed to get a lot of information from drug manufacturers, but it all comes from the drug manufacturers. So if there is a the way most adverse reactions are de detected is in clinical trials being performed by the drug company to see whether the drug is suitable for other uses. And so Vioxx, for example, you're probably all familiar with the Vioxx examples. The warning signals that Vioxx posed a risk of heart attack and stroke didn't come from patients filing adverse reaction reports. They came from Merck's own studies of Vioxx on other groups of patients. So one concern is, why wait until the FDA does it? The, you know, the manufacturer uh, is going to be the first uh, group, first party to have access to this information. The other concern is that the FDA's rules had always told drug manufacturers that they had not simply the ability, but they had the duty to change their drug label first and seek subsequent FDA approval if the drug sh labeling needed to be revised to reflect safety or health considerations. And so one real concern about the agency's reversal of position on this issue was, gee whiz, the agency is claiming that it alone can single-handedly do this job. Does it have the resources, the political will, the access to information to in fact do the job it now claims it can do on its own? I want to talk a little about the agency capture argument because it's a rare case in which we now have virtually all of the relevant records reflecting the internal discussions within the agency. Um, the House uh, uh, Committee on Oversight uh, and Government Reform uh, requested all of the internal deliberations within the agency on the development of 
these positions, both the first, the filing of these amici briefs, and then the formal statement of agency change of position in the Federal Register. And what's stunning about this is that the factual predicate that the agency used to base, uh, to justify its claim of position was all hotly disputed by the people who actually administered the programs. So the agency's decision re really rested on three grounds. One is state tort suits undermine our control of the label. Well, the people who administered this program said, wait, wait a minute, you don't quite get it. It's the companies that are really in charge. We approve the company's changes, and when we disagree, we negotiate with them. But we don't have the authority or the power to, in fact, really control drug labeling the way you envision. Second, <clears throat> the, the justification for the rule change rested on the notion that giving drug companies control over their drug labeling would cause them to engage in overwarning. That is, you're all lawyers or lawyers to be. The thought is that, well, if you can get out of product liability cases just by adding every conceivable adverse reaction on your drug label, you'll do it. Well, the agency people who deal with this day in and day out said, that doesn't happen. We've never seen a case. That's the man bite dog case. The dog bite man case <clears throat> is a case like Vioxx where the agency tried for over a year to get Merck to put a warning label on Vioxx about heart, heart attack and stroke. Merck refused to do it, and at the time, the agency had no power to compel changes to drug labeling that the drug company resisted. Had Merck not pulled Vioxx off the, off the market, probably still would not have a label reflecting heart attack and stroke risk. And so <clears throat> the agency people said, wait a minute, that doesn't reflect our reality. Um, Congress has since amended the law to, to give the agency more control over drug labeling, but it's a very cumbersome process. The agency now can overrule the pharmaceutical company, but only after going through essentially an exhaustive adjudicatory process. The last thing the agency claimed in its, in its Federal Register notice was that we have <clears throat> the authority to really monitor day-to-day adverse reactions and other signals of health problems with drugs, <clears throat> and we have the capacity to respond swiftly to newly emerging safety information. And once again, the FDA professional staff said, what? We don't do that. We do not have people looking at the literature in the adverse reaction data systematically for every drug on the market. That is not true. Yes, we, we look at the literature, yes, we're vigilant, but we don't have that capacity. So what lessons do we draw from this? Uh, this is one of those cases in which I think the real questions about the agency, the, the legitimacy and rationality of the agency's claim that it should, its action should preempt across the board. And for, for constitutional scholars, the agency claim is really essentially a facial challenge to state tort law. What the agency is saying in every case in which we, we approve the label, our approval should wipe away state tort law. Not fact specific, but as a, as a categorical matter. Um, and so my submission is that the, the, current, the current analytical framework the court applies in reviewing preemption cases is not sensitive to this question. I want to, if I have time, I want to just give you one more example. One of the most important implied preemption cases is Geyer versus American Honda. This is a case involving the Safety Act, the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration's organic statute that has a savings clause in it. The statute says that no standard here shall preempt state tort law. The Supreme Court 5 to 4 ruled in, in 2000 that the agency's airbag standard, which called for phase-in and airbags, preempted claims by those people who purchased cars that did not have an airbag during the phase-in time, because to allow, to allow a, a tort case to go forward would challenge the agency's decision about the, the phase-in. Uh, controversial decision 5-4. What's really interesting about that decision is the court relies very heavily on the prior airbag case 
that made it up to the Supreme Court, the State Farm case, one of the most famous cases in administrative law, where the court finds that the auto industry had waged the regulatory equivalent of war against NHTSA for years, uh, and that NHTSA had largely capitulated. So the story of State Farm is a story of agency capture. Fast forward a few years later to Geyer, where the same standard is being reviewed. But the court takes at absolute face value Nitz's claim that the, that the agency had carefully calibrated the phase in to, to benefit the public health. Now, the court doesn't mention the fact that the phase in approach that Nitz chose was the one proposed by the American Automobile Manufacturers Association, <coughs> was not generated internally to the agency. And so my submission is that in Geyer, the court should have, but this argument was not presented to it, so it's hard to fault the court for this, should have been more aware of the potential for agency capture and the utility of state tort litigation in fostering better and safer cars. Take, just take for a moment a look at NHTSA. Okay? It regulates every car, vehicle on the road, tires, everything that goes into an automobile. How many people do you think work for NHTSA? How many people? You talk about bloated government, you know, 630. 32 people do rulemaking for NHTSA. It is why that the standard for roof crush didn't change for 30 years, why after 37 years of the agency's existence, there still is no standard for fuel safety systems. When you get in your car to drive home tonight, the fuel safety system in it will comply with NHTSA standards because they haven't been changed since essentially 1967 when they were developed by GSA for government cars. But your fuel system will be a lot safer. Why? Because of product liability cases. Those of you who are my age will remember the Ford Pinto case. Um, those of you who are not, it's one of these horrible rear, rear, rear collisions that caused the fuel system to rupture. Many of you might have seen the famous GM CK trucks where the engineers were overruled by the designers and the fuel tanks were actually put on the outside of the vehicle. This was the largest selling pickup truck in the United States for years, but the gas tanks were literally outside the protective frame wheels. Well, guess what? Car companies don't do that any longer, not because NHTSA has made it improper. Under NHTSA's rules, you could still do it. But no automobile company in the world would build a car that way for product liability fears. Anyway, thank you very much. Um, good morning. I'd like to uh, also thank uh, Case Western for sponsoring uh, this symposium and uh, for inviting me to come participate. Um, I am up from South Texas, <laughs> where <laughs> it's about 65 degrees right now. I haven't seen snow in several years, so <laughs> uh, it's interesting to come up here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you to Case Western to sponsoring a symposium at the end of January. Okay. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the entire topic of um, preemption, uh, at least in the legal academy, is kind of hot topic uh, du jour. And over the last year, um, there have been three cases uh, in the Supreme Court uh, dealing with uh, the problem of preemption. Preemption. Last year was Regal versus Medtronic, um, which dealt with express preemption. Uh, this year, the court has had uh, the Altria versus a Good case, uh, which deals with problems of both express and implied preemption. And then the Wise case is also dealing with the concept of uh, implied preemption. Leading up to these three cases, uh, as Professor Vladek has said, um, in the uh, uh, the lower courts, the state courts, uh, the federal appellate courts are dozens and dozens uh, of preemption cases. And this in turn has given rise to a huge, huge body of academic literature. 
And uh, in addition to um, describing uh, what the courts have been doing in these cases, um, it's led to a great deal of very close uh, uh, analytical conversation among academics as to which of the forms of preemption are possibly justified um, and on what, uh, what grounds. Um, I'm not going to be dealing um, with any of that in part because I find it so, by the way, probably 75% of that has been written by Catherine Chalky, um, who has written huge numbers of articles uh, on preemption. Um, so anyway, that's not uh, the part of uh, this conversation that I want to talk about. Um, I want to talk about the politics of preemption, which I think is a very interesting backstory uh, to everything that we see percolating uh, in the courts. And in talking about the politics of preemption, um, in, in the last segment of my comments, um, my theme is that what's, one of the things that's so interesting about the politics of preemption is that it has given rise to strange bedfellows. And I'm going to talk about three different universes uh, of strange bedfellows. And <clears throat> last night it occurred to me that it's actually not three strange bedfellows, it's actually six strange bedfellows, because it takes two strange bedfellows in each set. Okay, anyway, <laughs> there's a lot of strange bedfellows out there. Okay, so um, my point of departure um, uh, that got me uh, basically thinking on this is a really, really good um, journalistic piece that appeared in the Sunday Times magazine last March, um, and it's by Jeffrey Rosen, who is a very thoughtful uh, writer and commentator uh, on the courts and particularly on the Supreme Court. Uh, you can Google this article probably very easily. And the article is called Supreme Court Inc., Supreme Court Inc., um, and his basic thesis is that um, uh, at least over um, the last two decades, um, there's been a shift in the docket of the Supreme Court and a shift in uh, the types of cases that the court is really interested in, and uh, basically the Supreme Court has become a business court and a business-oriented court. And he says at the beginning of this article uh, the following. One thing, however, is certain already. Uh, the transformation of the court was no accident. <coughs> it represents the culmination of a carefully planned behind-the-scenes campaign over several decades to change not only the courts, but also the country's political culture. And the rest of this article is taken up um, by um, uh, Jeffrey Rosen, uh, talking about this narrative of transformative change. And so what I'd like to do is very briefly describe um, uh, Jeffrey Rosen's narrative of this change in the Supreme Court to a business court. And then after I do that, I want to give you the Mullinex narrative, um, which is parallel to um, the narrative he's talking about, but to show you where the preemption piece fits in to what he's talking about. So um, here is basically uh, Jeffrey Rosen's narrative of change. Um, again, I think he's a very delightful writer, and he uses certain journalists, um, uh, if you will, uh, tricks to lure in the reader. And uh, this is one of them. He says, in talking about this transformation, uh, the origins of the business community's campaign to transform the Supreme Court can be traced back precisely to August 23rd, 1971. Okay, I was very intrigued by this. He can change the exact, uh, he didn't tell us the hour, but he said it can be traced back to August 23rd, 1971. And what he was talking about, what happened uh, on August 23rd, 1971, was he said, uh, then Lewis Powell, who was an attorney, uh, sent a memo uh, to Eugene Snyder at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. And in this memo, Lewis Powell um, uh, was uh, describing to Eugene Snyder basically what Lewis Powell perceived to be uh, an attack on uh, the business community um, and the U.S. economic system. And what he did in this memo was basically urge Eugene Snyder um, uh, uh, to um, have the U.S. Chamber of Commerce to begin to um, a multi-front lobbying effort, um, basically not only in, uh, in Congress, but in judicial fora as well, uh, to represent the interests of business communities um, in various governmental uh, efforts. And the memo also suggested that not only was the U.S. economy and business interests under attack, um, but um, Lewis Powell also said um, that there was a need, basically, to establish on the uh, business side of the docket 
um, uh, some kind of um, mechanism uh, for countering established uh, left-wing advocacy, ad, <coughs> advocacy groups, uh, particularly he was talking about public citizen, uh, public citizen uh, and this need to uh, counter the forces of naderism. Mr. Vladek. Okay. <laughs> it's very interesting because two months uh, after Lewis Powell wrote this memo um, to the United States Chamber of Commerce, uh, then uh, President Nixon appointed Lewis Powell to the Supreme Court. And so, um, in essence, okay, the person who was advocating this position was then on the Supreme Court. Um, what happened then was that the Chamber of Commerce um, did uh, pick up on this, uh, this exact um, point, and um, beginning in the 1980s, but it would take um, a little bit more time than that, uh, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and similar um, uh, business-oriented um, uh, entities within Washington, D.C., began um, a program, basically, of lobbying on behalf of um, business interests. Um, the other thing that happened was until the mid-1980s, there was no group of law firms, um, particularly in Washington, D.C., that really had um, uh, as its work um, the business of arguing cases before the Supreme Court uh, on behalf of uh, the business community. Um, however, in 1985, uh, Rex Lee, who was Reagan's Solicitor General, um, left government basically to start a Supreme Court appellate practice at Sidley and Austin. And this was the beginning again of these boutique practices um, in major um, Washington law firms uh, basically that would begin to either represent business clients or file amicus briefs uh, in these cases before the Supreme Court. Um, also, and this is on uh, Jeffrey Rosen's rendition, uh, the Chamber of Commerce and these other um, groups that would um, begin to be um, founded, were also inspired in 1987 by the thwarted Bork nomination. And so this gave, again, additional impetus to the idea that the business community and conservative interests needed to get organized uh, to form a lobbying uh, 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 set of groups, uh, both in Congress, the agencies, uh, and before the courts. Um, what, again, uh, is happening in this unfolding narrative is that um, Supreme Court clerks, former conservative uh, Supreme Court clerks for uh, conservative justices, would leave the court and then go to these organizations such as the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Uh, the chamber began a concerted program and effort to lobby both Congress and the White House, as well as administrative agencies. Um, Jeffrey Rosen describes how Ted Olson, um, also a former Solicitor General, became a powerhouse repeat litigator on behalf of business communities before the Supreme Court. And basically, looking at this whole narrative over two decades, Jeffrey Rosen is able to conclude um, that all these efforts have had significant impact. Um, and he looks at the results, again, just looking at what's happened on the Supreme Court, um, is that business has had a, a, a very, very favorable track record, uh, particularly in the area of cutting back on consumer suits, uh, in the area of punitive damages. Uh, this is kind of a parallel track where the Supreme Court has issued probably, um, you know, eight, eight or so uh, major decisions basically um, dealing with constitutional limitations on punitive damages. And then the third area that he discusses in his article are the preemption cases, and he has a lengthy discussion of last term's uh, decision in the Regal case. So that's Jeffrey Rosen's narrative, and I think that um, it's pretty correct. What I want to do is overlay my narrative on this, which is uh, runs parallel and concurrent to what he's talking about. And whereas Jeffrey Rosen focuses on Supreme Court Inc., uh, basically making the point that the Supreme Court has become uh, this uh, agency for um, uh, supporting and validating business interests, um, what I want to suggest um, is that the narrative is, um, I think, more complicated and more complex than that. And what you have here is a parallel narrative of executive, legislative, administrative, uh, and judicial uh, initiatives um, basically to achieve um, a platform of what's uh, called civil justice reform. And what we tend to do as academics is only to look at the judicial piece because we're really focused on decisions coming out of the courts, particularly the Supreme Court. But if you look at, um, again, going back over a 30-year span, um, there basically has been kind of a concerted effort um, by multiple actors uh, including professional lobbyists and professional lobbyists both on the 
uh, plaintiff side as well as the defense side of the docket, um, basically to uh, advocate um, uh, positions on behalf of their uh, clients. Um, my narrative goes back to um, the Bush Quail election in 1988-1989. And uh, there are probably people in the room who weren't even born then, okay? But so if, if you reach back and you um, paid attention to that particular campaign, during the Bush uh, Quail campaign, uh, campaign at the end of the 1980s, they had as part of their platform something known um, as a platform for civil justice reform. And actually, Dan Quayle was the point person on going out uh, and talking about um, this need for a uh, reform of the civil justice system. And I'll talk about this because um, it took a few years for this to, to gain traction. In 1991, Congress actually passed something called the Civil Justice Reform Act, um, which, again, probably many of you uh, haven't heard of. But it was part of this notion uh, in the Bush Quail years uh, that there needed to be so uh, something done about the civil justice system. After Clinton was elected, the midterm elections in 1993-94, basically there was a reversal of power in the Congress and the Republicans took over. And this was the Newt Gingrich um, Congress. And some of you may remember um, the major platform uh, brought forward by Newt Gingrich was the famous contract with America. As a matter of fact, there was this famous tableau of Republicans standing on the steps of the cap Capitol with the contract that was blown up like one of those big checks that you know, when you win Publishers Clearinghouse, they had the contract with America, and they came out on the Capitol steps. They said, this is the contract uh, with America. This was 1993, 1994. And what was the contract with America all about? Well, it was about civil justice reform. And basically, on, on the Republican side uh, of the aisle, um, the whole theme of this was to curb excesses and abuses of our overly litigious society. And what I just want to do is tick off for you um, all of the pieces, if you will, uh, of this mo uh, movement for civil justice reform. Um, basically, the grievances uh, on, on the um, Republican side of the aisle were fueled by um, uh, basically dismay with entrepreneurial plaintiff's attorneys. Um, the contract with America, um, its major goal was to achieve tort reform, to curb or limit frivolous lawsuits, which in turn would lead to this movement for heightened pleading requirements uh, as a, a ticket to getting your case into court, attorney's fees. Um, uh, a major portion of the civil justice reform movement uh, was basically to institute, was to repudiate the American rule and uh, institute a lo loser pay rule uh, in the American system. Uh, part of civil justice ref reform agenda was to cap compensatory damages, to curb jury excesses, uh, to deal with um, basically the vast abuses of class action litigation, discovery abuse, junk science in the courts, and then also on this list was to do something about punitive exempl exemplary uh, and hedonic damages. So this basically, these were all the characteristics of this civil uh, justice reform movement, which had its origins uh, back in the Bush Quail campaign. Um, what was, what's very interesting about this list, if you look at it, um, is that preemption doctrine or the whole idea of preemption was not on it, all right? That would come later as a possible mechanism uh, of uh, uh, helping to effectuate uh, civil justice reform. And so if, if you understand that the civil justice reform agenda uh, was very much out there um, after the midterm elections uh, in the uh, first term of, of Clinton, what we then see is the inability um, of, of the Republicans to legislate through Congress um, many pieces of the civil justice reform agenda. And so this gave rise to what uh, the commentators uh, in many places call stealth tort reform. In other words, if you couldn't legislate it through Congress, you were going to get stealth tort reform by other means. Um, and um, one of the major uh, ways of achieving this stealth tort reform basically was through the doctrine uh, of preemption. So what do we see? Um, this, the idea of trying to achieve stealth reform, uh, tort reform through um, preemption uh, basically is achieved on several fronts, all right? There is the leg legislative agenda uh, initiatives um, where you get congressional action in the 1990s uh, to enhance the scope of statutory preemption uh, through um, express preemption uh, clauses and statutes, and then also what is very discussed in the literature, the problem of preemption by uh, preamble. 
Um, you have administrative uh, uh, initiatives, as uh, mentioned by uh, Professor Vladek, which is a regulatory reversal of um, policy uh, concerning interpretation of preemption clauses, most notably by the FDA, um, and um, uh, in addition to which you get a pro-preemption uh, position, which is supported by uh, sympathetic conservative regulatory administrators. Um, in the same time frame, again, moving into the early 1990s, you have uh, the beginnings of judicial initiatives. And this is where um, the entities uh, on the defense side of the dockets representing business interests are coming in full bore, either through the law firms representing business clients or through uh, entities like the Chamber of Commerce filing uh, amicus briefs. It's very interesting to go and look at all the preemption cases and see who filed amicus briefs because they're repeat players and they come back in case after case after case of uh, the same groups of people representing basically the same interests. In 1992, the major case is uh, uh, the Chipolone case, and then throughout the 1990s, um, uh, down through uh, last year and this year, case after case after case, and I, I have the list of the cases here, but I'm not going to bore you with them. Um, and then lastly, the other piece of this puzzle is in 2005, um, Congress enacted uh, the Class Action Fairness Act. And the Class Action Fairness Act, um, again, was a Republican initiative uh, uh, basically inspired and largely advocated um, uh, by the business community uh, to get a removal provision to get class actions out of state courts uh, and into federal courts. Um, and um, uh, the, this was very favored by the business community because if you can get cases removed out of federal, uh, state court into federal court coupled with a strong preemption defense, um, not only can you affect uh, individual cases, but you can also kill off big cases as well. All right, so that's my narrative overlaid on Jeffrey Rosen's narrative. Oh, time. I don't get to talk about strange bedfellows, which is the most interesting part. <laughs> can I have two minutes? Okay, so I'm going to tell you, uh, and this will be very short. Um, there's three strange bedfellows uh, in all of this. Um, the first is, historically, there always was a Supreme Court presumption against preemption of state police power regulations. And if you read the preemption cases, they all say that in the, in the beginning. Um, but what's happened in, in, the, in the preemption cases um, is you get this really strange thing, which is conservative jurists, okay, Scalia, Thomas, and now we've got Alito, uh, Roberts, basically favoring um, federal regulatory schemes and preemption of state law uh, and common law uh, and statutory claims. Um, and so people who are kind of on the right wing and in favor of states' rights are suddenly uh, in favor of federal regulatory power. Okay, it's really quite strange. And preemption doctrine also illustrates attention even within, uh, even uh, among right-wing conservatives, because on the one hand, you have pragmatic free market conservatives who favor business, but then you have the ideological states' rights conservatives um, who obviously don't favor big government, and yet they're allied together in supporting preemption doctrine. Um, my second set of strange bedfellows uh, is the fact that you can have liberal co conservative alliances in support of preemption. And this was illustrated by the Regal decision. We have somebody like Justice Stephen Breyer, who favors broad federal regulatory power, aligning with the conservative wing of the, of the court, um, uh, basically to support preemption uh, in the Regal case. And then finally, my last strange bedfellows example is off of an article that was co-authored um, by Professor Shockey with my former colleague, Professor Azakaroff, um, which basically makes the brief that um, uh, basically um, preemption is kind of backdoor federalization. And this argument is basically um, being advanced uh, in, in support of the theory uh, that there are other indicia um, across the board of federalization, and this argument is being basically impressed into use uh, in order to support an argument in favor of uh, the revival of federal common law in class action lawsuits. Um, and, and so um, on the plaintiff's side of the bar, uh, you find uh, class action plaintiff's lawyers advancing an argument um, that preemption is supporting uh, kind of a return, if you will, to uh, application of federal common law and class actions, which I find very, very strange. And I'm sorry I've always stayed.
I should speak into this thing so it's recorded for posterity. <laughs> Normally I'm much louder than the microphone, but <laughs> I will. Um, I don't know why they invited me today. Um, I'm not a torch guy like, you know, Kathy's done advanced statistical work on punitive damages. David is one of the great veteran um, lawyers of Washington, D.C., before agencies, before the Supreme Court. Linda is one of the masters of class actions. Why me? So I thought, you know, um, it reminds me of what my judge, Pat Higginbotham, told me. I hire Yaleys from a layman's perspective. <laughs> the tech people want you to stand back. Oh, uh, you want me to stand back from the microphone? Can I do that? And still be heard? Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you don't want me to do that. Um, and then I thought, no, the reason why they invited me is I'm a federalism nut. And um, I'm on record as being a federalism nut. So in a pre preemption debate, you should have somebody who will speak on behalf of maximal state power. And yet somehow flying to the middle of America has made me moderate. <laughs> and so I want to make four quick points. And I want to finish before the minute hands hit six, um, commensurate with my modest qualifications to talk. Um, I want to first suggest that preemption should be based, except in a few areas, like ERISA preemption or Section 301 preemption under the Labor Management Relations Act, preemption should be based upon purpose. Specifically, it should be based upon a conflict between a state's purpose and the federal agency's purpose in controlling a risk that that agency is charged with regulating or supervising. You need a conflict of purpose, not effects with the exception of ERISA preemption and a few other areas that does, do use effects-based preemption. Number two, and this is where I'm going to be moderate, I think I'm going to disagree with David on his argument against preemption. I think the fact that a state actor's decision does not have any effect of impeding compliance with an agency's judgment does not, yeah, I'm just not going to stop. <laughs> That'd be on camera, um, does not um, eliminate preemption of that state judgment if that judgment has the purpose of impeding compliance. And therefore, for instance, if a state damages judgment from a state jury has the purpose of impeding compliance with a federal agency's purpose of controlling a risk, that damages judgment is preempted even if the company that incurred the damage could comply with the judgment by paying the money and comply with the agency by complying with the agency's rule. Second, third, I want to disagree with Kathy, again, based on this purpose-based te test for preemption. The federal agency's judgment preempts only if that judgment advances a purpose delegated to the agency. No federal agency, to my knowledge, is an agency in charge of economic efficiency, economic prosperity, uniformity. None of these goals have been delegated to the main regulatory agencies in Washington, D.C. So if the agency's purpose is promoting economic efficiency, economic prosperity or uniformity, they can't preempt a state judgment even if that ju state judgment contradicts the agency judgment. That means, I think, that preemption should be limited to risk-risk trade-offs. I want to explain what I mean by that in a second. Fourth, I think this purpose-based test will address, help address some of the problems that David pointed out so eloquently with agency inertia. Agency rulemaking is unbelievably slow, but no one, not OIRA, not the state intergovernmental lobbies like the National Governance Association or NCSL or et cetera, not the plaintiff's bar. No one has an economic incentive to overcome this inertia and put issues on agency's agenda, especially dealing with post-market surveillance of risk. Nobody does because there's no money in it. But this will give somebody an incentive to put issues on agency's agenda, namely manufacturers. Because in order to get preemption, they're going to have to put a specific risk to safety on the agency's agenda and say, make a rule. And that would be a wonderful thing to overcome the Heckler v. Cheney bias against rulemaking that no one has been otherwise able to overcome. Now let me just clarify some of these points quickly. I think that purpose-based preemption is the only way to explain cases like Altria v. Good. I'm not going to go into the details except to say constantly the court will say, we do not preempt or we do not find that agency rules preempt state action, unless state action is addressed precisely to the kind of thing that the agency is regulating. Let me give you an example. Sales taxes. State sales taxes definitely raise the cost of drugs. But if the FDA came in and said, we have a rule against state sales tax because we think it prevents safe and efficient drugs from getting to the American public, they'd be locked in the loony bin. 
And the answer would be the state purpose is not addressed to safety or effectiveness of drugs. It's addressed to raising revenue for the states. So sales taxes would never be preempted, even though state sales taxes have a much bigger economic effect on the sale of drugs than any number of tort suits. Imagine if you get an exemption from New York's 10% sales tax for aspirin. Sell a lot more aspirin, right? But preemption would never happen. Why? Because in most contexts, preemption is purpose-based. If the state does not have a purpose to contradict the federal judgment, there ain't no preemption. And that's so obvious. It's as obvious as the air that we breathe that we forget that point. Okay, well, what does this mean? Well, this means I disagree with David on something. I'm going to be moderate today. Normally, I hate preemption deeply. But David has said something that I think m must be mistaken. David has said in an article with um, Kessler, and it's a wonderful article, but he has said, look, you know, a manufacturer can comply with a damages judgment and also comply with an agency reg, even if the damages judgment punishes the manufacturer for doing something that the reg requires. Let me give you a hypothetical. It's completely hypothetical, because after all, I have no competence in a lot of these areas. Imagine if the Federal Aviation Administration said, we will not allow airlines to give a parachute to each passenger, because it's a danger to safety. You know, if that pilot says, we've got to land in the East River, all the passengers will strap on their par parachute and run for the exit, and people will be killed. They've made a finding with specific facts that says it's a danger to safety to have parachutes. A state um, jury finds an airline liable for, you know, millions of dollars because they didn't have parachutes. If I understand David correctly, he would say that shouldn't be preempted because after all, you could pay out the millions of dollars and still not have parachutes. But you see, the purpose of the state judgment is to stigmatize, contradict, or otherwise deter compliance with the agency reg. That is the purpose. It's got to be the purpose, especially if punitive damages are, required, uh, are available, and certainly even if compensatories are available, because compensatories are based on negligence, and negligence is a judgment that the airline did something wrong. You cannot say that something's wrong if the agency requires it. So that's why I think I disagree with David, based upon this purpose-based test. If the jury's verdict has the purpose of saying to the airline, bad airline, you should not have not supplied the passengers with the parachutes. You should have handed out parachutes. And the agency says, good airline, don't hand out parachutes. It seems to me bizarre to say that that judgment would not be preempted. Okay, so that's where I look like I'm a preemption kind of guy. Third point, and look, the minute hand's just creeping up on the six. I think I'll make it. Because my fourth point is patently obvious. <laughs> Third point, Kathy Sharkey has said that if an agency makes a very specific judgment about some issue and a state court contradicts it, then that agency judgment should preempt the state court. But this strikes me as mistaken because it depends on the purpose of the federal agency. Let me give you an example, same FAA hypothetical example. Suppose the FAA says, we will not require parachutes because we just think it's a waste of money. They don't really increase safety. They don't deter safety, but it's a waste of money. We don't want to impose that burden on industry. Suppose then a state jury says, oh, you know, you need to have parachutes. In our judgment, we think that that is negligent not to have parachutes. I do not think that the agency judgment, no matter how specific, no matter how backed by evidence of the superfluousness of parachutes, can preempt um, that um, s state tort verdict. And the reason is simply that the federal judgment is not a judgment in pursuit of safety. It's pursuant of economic efficiency. And guess what? The FAA is the Federal Aviation Administration, not the Federal Economic Efficiency Administration. And so it's completely irrelevant that they have lots of fact findings that the regulation is superfluous. Let me put it more bluntly. In my view, and I think the case law will largely back me up on this, although Geyer would be the case most in tension, unless the agency could ban a manufacturer from requiring a safety precaution, the agency cannot ban the state courts from requiring that safety precaution. In other, in other words, unless the agency could say to some manufacturer, you may not do X, because X is a risk to safety. They can't say to the states, you may not require X, because then they're not really requiring something related to safety. Now, of course, the agency is perfectly free not to require X. But there, I think, if their only purpose is to encourage economic efficiency, economic prosperity, or uniformity, which is sort of the standard trope um, of industries seeking preemption, they are not in pursuit of their agency mission. That's three points. One last one, real quick. Why is this a good thing? Preemption is the bait that will get manufacturers to put issues on the rulemaking agenda of agencies. It's extremely expensive to go through notice and comment rulemaking. Very few people want to do it, and the ones who do want to do it, like those nuts public citizen, 
Well, you know, they face Heckler v. Cheney. It's very difficult for them to find somebody who is standing to push the issue. It's very difficult to overcome agency inertia. Agencies don't like to act. It's expensive and difficult to act. You get into trouble with someone. And so agencies take years and years to make rules. You need someone to get it on the agenda. Will defense a plaintiff's bar do it? No. Why would a plaintiff's bar want to make a rule? There's no money involved. You can't take a third of a regulation. Right? So plaintiff's bar is not going to do it. What about OIRA? For years, liberals like um, Cass Sunstein said OIRA could issue prompt letters to agencies to get the agencies to act. As my dean, Ricky Pavez, has pointed out in a recent article with Nicholas Bagley, OIRA's number of prompt letters is more than my notes. They almost never issue prompt letters. There's a reason for this. It's extremely difficult to get a record. If you're a generalist, one of the desk officers at OIRA, to get a record sufficient to make a convincing act a case for action before a specialized agency. So OIRA very rarely goes to EPA and says, make a rule. Because the EPA say, well, what kind of rule? A rule on nickel cadmium? Yeah, nickel whatever it's called. Right? OIRA doesn't know about nickel cadmium. They don't know how to, whether that risk is great enough to justify the expenditure. And so they don't. They do not issue prompt letters. And I swear to you, you see me here on film, I hope. Am I on film yet? <laughs> that OIRA under Cass Sunstein, who loves prompt letters, will issue very few prompt letters and will not be the source of major agency action. Because the institutional barriers to OIRA really getting agency to move transcend ideology. It's just hard for a generalist like Cass to tell specialist agencies what to do. So it won't happen, in my opinion. I might be wrong, but you heard it here first. <laughs> Last, that leaves the state intergovernmentals, National Association of Counties, National League of Cities, National Governors Association, Conference of State Legislatures. Are they about to go and put issues on agencies' agenda? No. Two reasons. A, they can't make campaign contributions, and so they have very little political clout. My own view is that the big seven in Washington are some of the least effective lobby groups because they can't give money. Two, they're bipartisan. Typically, they have to have a chair of one party and a vice chair of another, which means on any specific issue, gun control, tort reform, it's very hard for them to take an aggressive stance. They issue blasé general statements about preemption, but I have yet to see them come in full bore with a deep, deep empirical argument about a specific risk, like, say, asbestos or something like that, and why sh their regulation should not be preempted. If there ain't any money in it for them, they don't, aren't aggressive. The state's attorney generals have been very aggressive on civil litigation. They have not been aggressive in before the administrative agencies. That leaves def manufacturers. If you said to manufacturers, you can get insulated from a state tort suit, if you can get a specific rule that has the purpose of controlling the specific risk that's been delegated to an agency, I suspect you'll see them queued up before the regulatory agencies asking for specific rules. And I say, four minutes past what I said I would be, but one minute within my 15 minutes, that, that would be a good thing. Uh, good morning. I'm really excited uh, to be here and also thank uh, Case Western. Um, I'm also in, I think, the privileged position of coming at the tail end of uh, such an impressive and, of course, uh, Rick is way too humble because he's uh, staked out positions. Uh, interestingly, to needle him, of course, his biggest preemption piece is called Against Preemption. I'd like, I'd like to say that sort of the moderate position to which he's come to, the sort of Aristotelian golden mean, is very <laughs> close to the position Sharkey has been uh, pushing. So perhaps by uh, subtle osmosis, our being uh, colleagues has some uh, positive effect. But in actually all seriousness, um, and I've never, I haven't told Rick this, right, so the positive point is that one of the main reasons, uh, one of the things that made my uh, uh, desire to join the NYU faculty was actually his presence on it and his protean uh, approach to issues like the one that we're talking about today, preemption, because um, it strikes me, I do teach torts, I'm a torts and products liability person, but I was, I've always been fascinated by broader questions of regulation, particularly in health and safety, and I think it's not surprising that when I look back uh, at, at issues that have engaged me, the two main ones have been punitive damages and now federal preemption of state uh, tort law. And each of these share interesting uh, features. One, there is this element of backdoor federalization to which Professor Mullenix uh, alluded. And secondly, um, and it's one that I've thought about sort of recently with my um, seemingly obsession about what's going on at the U.S. Supreme Court level, even though obviously uh, law professors sometimes over 
obsess about that and don't look more broadly. But what's fascinating to me is it was once said to me quite emphatically, remember, the Supreme Court doesn't do tort law, right? So, so um, as opposed to, say, the federal courts of appeals that hear an enormous number of diversity cases, products cases, they do a lot of interesting tort law. And it strikes me that actually the Supreme Court, at least of late, does a lot of really important tort law, so particularly in the punitive damages realm and here in the preemption realm. Now, it may not do that particularly well. And I think that there is, um, there's a real need. And um, on the one hand, um, one could suggest that politics is everything. And I think Professor Molnix provided a very um, interesting and um, certainly you know, certainly part, politics is part of understanding issues like punitive damages and preemption. But as, a, as an academic, I think that even if it's foolhardy and uh, doesn't leave anywhere, one of the privileges of being academic is you could try to think about a kind of coherent analytical framework that you wish, right, that courts would look to when deciding these kinds of issues. And in preemption, that's kind of, that's been my uh, aim. And it started, I kind of got into this um, interest somewhat indirectly, um, um, by reading every Supreme Court products liability preemption case starting in 1992. As, as uh, Professor Vladek mentioned, that's a watershed year. In the Chipolone case, that was the first time the U.S. Supreme Court read in a federal statute the idea of requirements that federal requirements could preempt state requirements. They read the rule require the word requirements to encompass state common law tort suits as opposed to just state regulations and state positive law. And that therefore is a is a key watershed moment or timing because before then we don't have Supreme Court products liability preemption um, uh, of the sort that we have uh, today. Now reading those cases carefully, and it's um it's an easy project, right? I don't actually set my sights uh, as high as some of my fellow colleagues who will read thousands of opinions. You know, here we're talking about uh, a number I can count on two hands. So reading these cases, it struck me just as a positive empirical matter. I did a little more than just read the cases, but um, uh, that the position that the U.S. Supreme Court comes to in terms of whether it will preempt or won't preempt in these instances exactly aligned right, with the position that was argued by the relevant underlying agency. So this was the FDA in the Lohr case where the answer was don't preempt underlying state uh, tort litigation. It's the Buckman case. It's the Regal case. Um, of last term dealing with uh, medical device preemption. NHTSA followed suit. Uh, at the Coast Guard followed suit in an interesting case called Spritzma. Now, what was interesting to me is notwithstanding this, you often hear preemption jurisprudence is a muddle. Or as Professor Vladek said, and I think this is a, um, a diplomatic understatement, right, is tremendous uncertainty in their jurisprudence. Uh, in the latest case, Altria, Justice Stevens, in his majority opinion, says, of course, there's no, quote, unquote, theoretical elegance in what I'm about to lay out. I would say there's no coherence. So I don't, um, I mean, in terms of a framework, I'm not talking about outcome of opinions. It really frustrates me, looking at the U.S. Supreme Court jurisprudence, that they're not engaged in setting out an appropriate framework. So first point would be this presumption against preemption. Uh, Professor Molinix alluded to it. It is actually not the case that it's trotted out in every single case in the Supreme Court products liability realm. It's trotted out rather strategically. And in fact, if you break the decisions up into express preemption and implied preemption, express preemption being where there's an actual explicit clause in the relevant federal uh, regulation, it was trotted out most um, in almost all of the express preemption cases that the U.S. Supreme Court was uh, deciding, and not in the implied. You would think, right, just if you were encountering this in the first instance, if you need a thumb on the scale, if you have no idea how to decide a case and you need to rely on a default presumption, you should at least do it in the cases where you're not guided by quote unquote statutory terms. This obviously, Justice Scalia, I guess, saw the light somewhat uh, on this point, trying to push it in last term's regal decision, which is the medical devices case, where the court, and this is important to note in the strange bedfellows context, this is an eight to one decision, right? This isn't just a single justice crossing over, et cetera. As Professor Vladek noted, he, uh, there's a lone dissent by Justice Ginsburg. Ironically enough, I'm cited in the dissent as well. I <laughs> opinion, but, on every score. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but in any event, in that case, there's no mention 
of the presumption against preemption. And many scholars thought, well, maybe this court has actually decided to move away from that paradigm, is thinking of another framework. Altria, the most recent decided case, five to four, there's a very strong statement that says, we apply the presumption against preemption in both express and implied preemption cases. I mean, what is going on here? The court's memory, right, even if you could argue, well, the Roberts court should only be looking back, you know, and shouldn't think back to the Rehnquist court and coherence for theoretical or other reasons, but the memory can't be that short when you're trying to lay out a kind of framework. And I guess I'm frustrated because I'm not satisfied that the court should be taking a claim-by-claim claim view to preemption. We should have some kind of uh, analytic framework. The framework, if very briefly, that I've kind of tried to argue, and it stems from this empirical notion that agencies have strongly <laughs> influenced the court, the Supreme Court. Uh, it stems from trying to bring that to the surface, right? And the normative argument is going to be much harder to make than the positive argument because, in fact, the U.S. Supreme Court is very nervous about reliance on the underlying agency. I think for many of the reasons uh, Professor Vladek uh, alluded to, a kind of vague notion of agency capture, although not understanding if there's any empirical basis to this, a vague concern about the politicization of the agency process, particularly in the most recent, uh, bu most recent examples in the Bush administration with respect to what was going on, particularly in the FDA, NHTSA, et cetera. So it's been very cagey about what kind of reliance it's paying. It doesn't come out and say what, uh, what this is. I think the framework, and I've called this an agency reference model, should bring this to the surface. So courts, when they're making products liability preemption decisions, should actually have to engage in uh, a process whereby they try to figure out, as, uh, as uh, Professor Hills was alluding to, exactly what was the risk-risk trade-off that the agency was up to. I guess Professor Hills and I are now on a piece with respect to the idea that instances where juries are just being asked to do a redo of whatever the FDA did, those should be preempted on a narrow conflict type preemption. That's a sort of practical example. What this excludes, and it excludes on my model as well, is FDA comes in and approves a drug at time one, and then at time two, right, where some kind of new risks have come to light, et cetera, the manufacturer gets blanket immunity based on that initial approval. I think that would be terrible for a lot of the reasons that Professor Hills uh, alluded to. My model is trying also to do two things. It's trying to prompt the manufacturers, right, to go back to the FDA. Once they get this information, this data, and they go back to the FDA, and the FDA, on the agency record, puts its reasons as to why when the manufacturer says, I want to add X to my label, and they say no, having looked at the same example, then they would gain preemption. So it is a kind of quid pro quo type model, and I think it would have that good effect. I also actually am more of a believer, so here is, I guess, where I'll um, spark some disagreement with Professor Hills in particular. I'm more of, um, I guess I'd say, an optimist with respect to agency forcing measures. Or at a minimum, here's the weaker, more modest way that I'd put it, I think that we haven't seen right, any kind of test of whether or not things uh, could be different, right, because, uh, and I have a couple of points to make here. One, I've argued before, in looking at these uh, cases, there's state and federal courts that have actually struggled for now several years about what to make of the strong pro-preemption position the FDA's been taking. The FDA's been intervening, Interestingly, and maybe we'll discuss this in, in the discussion period, they intervene in federal cases much more than state cases. Federal courts are more likely to call for the views of the FDA. There's definitely interesting federalism kind of um, uh, issues we could talk about, about the place of federal agency right, versus state court. This is a context where we don't have equivalent state agencies. We're not talking about mini state FDAs, uh, et cetera. But I've argued before that courts, which have come to kind of polar extreme positions, so in a nutshell, we see examples examples of courts that either bring up the con conjure, right, the ghost, so to speak, of the presumption against preemption, and say so that's basically outcome determinative. There's a presumption against preemption. We're talking about state tort law, no preemption. Other courts were starting to give Chevron or mandatory deference to basically whatever the FDA said. I think there's a lot of danger in both of those kinds of approaches, and I see no reason, for example, why courts couldn't condition any amount of deference, which would be a more moderate type deference, on the agencies having complied 
right, with executive order mandates. That's a start at least. There's an executive order on federalism that tells the agencies to do all sorts of things with respect to engagement with state interests. The FDA, NHTSA, all these groups flouted them openly without consequence, at least with respect to some of these uh, court decisions. So it would be a way, and I admit, albeit it's a kind of indirect way, that you could have challenge of some of these rules or regulations of the agency once it's before the court on this preemption uh, on this uh, preemption type inquiry. Second and uh, concluding point, because I too want to stay uh, within, my, uh, within my time, I don't think we've seen the beginnings, right, of what, and we'll call this the dawn of the new administration and why it's rife to think about new opportunities, right? Even if we think the whole process up to date has been entirely politicized and in fact preemption has stood in in the strange bellow Bed bedfellows context as a sort of pretext for deregulation, right? It is ironic. I, I got brought to numerous panels, including one of my favorites by the Federalist Society, and the title of the program was, Are We All Hypocrites? I mean, they didn't call it that, <laughs> but that's what we talked about outside. And I thought, well, as an academic, you know, I worry not. I try to have intellectual, if not theoretical elegance, I aim for coherence, right? But um, the idea there is, you know, suddenly all sorts of people are gung-ho Right, for the proposition that federal regulations, right, will reign supreme, what are they going to do, right, in an administration where there's a beefed up strong sense of the regulatory state? So, to my mind, what's really interesting here is that many of the actual players in these debates have, I think, political myopia. They're not thinking about models that would work in successive administrations. Obviously, academics, we have sort of that kind of a privileged role to be able to try to put forward some kind of um, uh, uh, model. And the piece that I'm working on where a lot of these difficulties and sort of the devil is in the details is judicial review component. Because I do think we need to see something more akin to a state farm hard look review by federal courts in this area. The only reason I think it's at all promising is that right now we have a kind of state farm versus Chevron schism. Namely, Chevron, if you read the case, seems to act like we really want political decision making on the part of the agencies. State farms apparatus is set up to sort of rein that in and police that. That. And I think it gives us maybe some hope that a state farm for a new dawning century administration where we lead towards the goal of what I'll call what actually the New York Times today on its front page is calling progressive federalism, right? One in which the states are harnessing their effort in tandem with the federal regulatory scheme. And this leads into I have absolutely no opposition when Professor Vladek is talking about the idea that states should have a role in enforcing federal standards. Note a lot of this preemption. Uh, even strong preemption decisions like that on the part of the U.S. Supreme Court in the Regal medical devices case uh, leaves open the idea that when states are enforcing the federal regulatory standard, so if there's enough evidence that we should have regulation at the national versus state-by-state -state laboratories of democracy type model, uh, you, you wouldn't be cutting that out, right? There is going to be some role for the states. I think there's even a greater role for the states in terms of prompting their participation in the agency rulemaking uh, process. And I'm not quite as pessimistic as Professor Hills, at least that we haven't seen, for example, that some of these groups like the National Center for State Legislatures, et cetera, could switch their agenda from their focus exclusively on getting anti-preemption through Congress to participation in this rulemaking uh, process. Thank you very much. Let me begin by asking if the panelists want to respond to each other at all. I think oh. it might be. <laughs> <laughs> David, why don't we start with you? All right. Well, um, you know, we invited Rod not only because he's modest and highly qualified, but because he, he was the designated bomb thrower on the panel. <laughs> uh, and I just want to res respond briefly to a couple of his points. I, I couldn't agree more with his purpose-based inquiry, and I think, you know, that would be my utopian solution. Of course, it would mean, <clears throat> essentially, that there is no preemption of state law because it's hard to imagine a state law where the purpose of tort law, deterrence and compensation, would be incompatible with the federal statute. There's no federal statute that wants to encourage unreasonable risk-taking, fraud, deception, or wants to deny people injured through no fault of their own compensation. So uh, <clears throat> I'm all in favor of, of Professor Hill's views. Uh, I just can't imagine that that's where the courts are going to end up. Second, I think there's some tension between that observation and this one criticism of the article I wrote with Dr. Kessler, 
which argues that because FDA regulation of labeling is a floor, that a, a, not a ceiling, that a state can rightly impose limitations that are not imposed by the FDA. And uh, I'd be glad to have that disagree with him, disagree with him later, but it is not the case that this is a regulatory requirement. I mean, it is not a regulation that is enacted with the full faith, with, with the force of law. It is not enforceable in that way. And I think it's wrong to equate the FDA's labeling approval with the formal issuance of a binding rule that has force and effect of law. That's a very technical point, but it's an important one in terms of preemption. Last, in terms of agency action forcing, well, I guess this is where I have the most fundamental disagreement with Professor Hills. If you take a look at what this administration did, all of it was, it, was administered by, by OIRA. I mean, OIRA, this little unknown entity within the Office of Management and Budget, coordinated this approach. And if you look at what the agencies did, wasn't limited to the FDA or NHTSA or the uh, Department of Agriculture or the Department of Labor. This was a government-wide effort that was initiated and, and pushed by political appointees within the White House. Uh, and, and just so you understand this, the courts do regularly force agencies to take action. And even those people without, uh, without votes to deliver or without campaign contributions to make have an important role in setting agency agendas. Um, just, just have no illusion about agencies being unresponsive to all sorts of pressure, including pressure that comes through uh, public uh, relations campaigns and humiliation and all sorts of things. So I, I'm not sure, <clears throat> but, but the last point is, I'm not sure that the agencies are the ones to be making these preemption determinations in the first place. Um, my principal submission is that Congress, not agencies, ought to make these decisions. <clears throat> I think there's an enormous dissonance between the court's implied ju preemption juris uh, jurisprudence, which wipes away actions, and the court's unwillingness to, to recognize implied rights of actions. I think the conservative justices, the Professor Mullenix, of talking about have a very difficult, very difficult task in Wyeth. It's an implied preemption case. They're going to have to rule to rule for Wyeth that although Congress did not set say so, the court ought to wipe away a right of action that's existed since the common law. That is incompatible with their jurisprudence about creating rights of action. And so I think, I think there are all sorts of odd bedfellows here, um, and it's going to be very interesting to see what the court does this term. Okay, um, I have two comments. Um, one is uh, directed to Professor Sharkey and then the other to Professor Hills. Um, first of all, in, uh, in response to the, the question uh, at the conference that you were at, the question of uh, are we all hypocrites, um, I, I just want to be very clear that at least on the, on the conservative side of the universe, I don't think that uh, the position of what the conservatives are doing is hypocritical at all. In other words, I don't think that um, all of these people uh, who are pro-preemption are closet federal regulators. Okay, I don't think that's what they're up to uh, at all uh, in basically um, uh, um, rendering decisions uh, in favor of robust preemption doctrine. Um, I think what's going on here is uh, basically that is a, a ratification of a very pro-business uh, position. So the pro-business interests basically have won the day uh, uh, with their advocates uh, uh, basically um, uh, in articulating a uh, very robust uh, preemption uh, type of doctrine. And the reason why I say that also is um, I think the same thing is true of CAFA, the Class Action uh, Fairness Act. Um, the purpose of class, the Class Action Fairness Act was not to nationalize uh, class action procedures. I, you know, anybody who believes that I think is, you know, I don't know, living in some alternative universe. CAFA was lobbied through, okay, um, by, uh, the, the, you know, the business interests in the, comp uh, the country basically to get class actions out of unfavorable uh, hellhole state court jurisdictions into the federal courts, not to federalize those cases, but basically because federal courts are much more stringent and more likely to dismiss class actions. That's what's going on. And to turn CAFA into some kind of backdoor federalization of class actions, again, I think it's pretty nutty. Um, the same thing with um, you know, construing what's going on with punitive damages. And in this article on backdoor federalization, 
um, uh, Professor Shockey and Azakarov are saying, oh, look at the punitive da damage jurisprudence of the Supreme Court. It's to federalize punitive damages. That's not what's going on at all with punitive damages, okay? It's been a consistent lobbying effort on behalf of the business community basically to restrict, limit, and or eliminate punitive damages. Um, to, so to say that these are all prototypical federal regulators on the Supreme Court is just, I think, a, a misinterpretation of what's going on. Um, I have a question uh, for Professor Hills, which is um, this notion that manufacturers and business entities are going to go rushing to the regulatory agencies and saying, we have this new risk, okay, give us, uh, you know, a, a rule or a regulation on it. M my question is, that's not what the Altria case was about at all. The Altria case was not about state law claims. The Altria case was brought under a state statute for deceptive practices, a consumer state deceptive practice um, uh, case. And so my question is, you know, is your vision that the tobacco companies are going to go running to the FDA <laughs> and say, you know, give us some ruling on uh, – they've been before the FDA. They, you know, the, the, um, the testing for cigarettes that gave them the ability to put on those labels, you know, the percentage of low tar, all of that had been done for several, several years. So I, it's hard for me to imagine how you think Altria was going to go running to the FDA and saying, here's the risk of – if you, if you drag your cigarette more deeply than somebody else, you're running a higher risk. What, I, what kind of risk? My question is, what were you expecting mm -hmm. them to do in your model of uh, how to um, uh, have, you know, an ironclad preemption defense? Mm -hmm. So I guess I should say something. Do I have to speak in this darn microphone? Yeah. God, all this, all this technology stuff. I'm a chalk and talk kind of guy. I'll stay back. Um, <laughs> so I just want to say quickly um, two things um, in response to David. Um, um, and one thing quickly about um, Linda's question about Altria. Um, it seems to me that juries that require precautions that in the judgment of agencies are actually dangerous precautions should get preempted. If a jury requires something of a manufacturer and an agency says that requirement actually undermines health and safety and we are empowered to protect it, the judgment should get preempted. I can't see any easy way to contradict this except by saying the jury's judgment enforcing common law duties is not a requirement under federal law. But it seems to me that judgments require compliance with duties, that Breyer got it right in Geyer although he pretended to avoid the question, it seemed bizarre to me to say that somehow the common law is so different from statutes that it does not impose requirements. If a jury is issuing a judgment saying you were negligent in not doing X, they are saying you are required to do X and we are punishing you for your failure to comply with the duty. And it seems to me that therefore, if you really could make a case, and this is where I think David is overwhelmingly persuasive, um, if you could make a case that overwarning, putting lots of warnings on a bottle, will cause consumers to get sicker. And so jury verdicts that say, put more warnings on that bottle, put them in bright red, make them talk to the consumer like those Hogwarts little messages that you get, you know, Harry Potter gets. Howlers! You know, make them loud and day. If, if, if the FDA could make a persuasive case that that would actually undermine health, those jury verdicts get preempted. Now, where David um, and Dr. Kessler are overwhelmingly persuasive, is that there is zero evidence, zero, nothing that would comply with State Farm that overwarning endangers health. Um, at the most, you could say that those extra warnings aren't read by anyone, that they wouldn't do any good, that they're superfluous. I could see that. You know, nobody reads the uh, little highlights and anything like that. But that's not a justification for preemption, right? If it's superfluous, it's not undermining health. If it ain't undermining health, the agency has no business preempting. That's my basic point. The agency has to show that this will stop safe and effective drugs because that's what the FDA is in charge of, encouraging safe and effective drugs. And therefore, it seems to me that the overwarning argument is bogus. But if it could be made, the jury verdict should be preempted. So that's my first point. Second point on OIRA. I think OIRA can stop agency action very easily. But I think the best empirical work on what OIRA, OIRA does contradicts the highest hopes that people like Elena Kagan placed in OIRA. People like Cass Sunstein and Elena Kagan said, don't be afraid of the Reagan executive order on cost-benefit analysis, because it can be used to prompt agency action just as easily as it can be used to undermine it. And in the Clinton years, when you had people in charge of OIRA who seemed to like regulation, you'd think you'd get lots of prompt letters. And what Ricky Revez found is you got very, very few. 
And I think there are institutional rather than ideological reasons for that. It's hard for an agency generalist to get a regulatory agency to act, a special agency to act. That's an empirical claim, and I could be wrong. But I think I'm right, and I think the data supports me. Um, and that's why I think it would be great to get the manufacturers to line up and say, we need protection from state tort judgments. Now, sometimes it won't work. For instance, manufacturers cannot go to the FDA and preempt sales taxes, right? No matter how much they're taxed, they can't go to the FDA. Because the FDA's, pardon me, the state sales tax does not have the purpose of making a judgment about safe and effective drugs. And therefore, of course, you cannot go to the FDA to escape sales taxes under state law because that's not within the portfolio of the FDA. Likewise, if it is true, and this is the only controversial part about Altria, and this is my last point, I'll shut up. If it is true that the state consumer protection statute is really just an effort to stop fraud, misrepresentation, then of course you can't go to the FDA or any other agency charged with protecting health and say, hey, allow us to commit fraud, <laughs> right? Because the, the, the fraud or commercial fair dealing is not within the FDA's bailiwick. And so, of course, no, that's not going to, Altria will not, no, nothing there will give you an incentive, um, manufacturers an incentive to go to the agency. But in many cases, state tort verdicts do have the purpose of regulating health and safety. And their basic message is, you have acted unsafely. Whenever they say that, my purpose-based theory would encourage the manufacturer to go to the agency and say, they said we were unsafe. I want you to say that if we obeyed their judgment, we would be unsafer. And that, I think, is a big incentive for them to get preemptive power. Now, I should say just this one point about Altria. I'm walking down the hallway at NYU, and Richard Epstein comes up to me and said, did you read Altria be good? And I said, yes, states' rights won, because I'm a federalism now. And Richard Epstein said, you think that's right? That, that opinion was fraud, right? Because the basic idea is Stevens, in a totally convoluted opinion, says the following. The state, with its consumer safety law, isn't regulating health. It's not interested in the unhealthy effects of low-tar advertising. They're just trying to prevent misrepresentations or fraud. Yeah, and Richard Epstein didn't buy that. This is very much like the Gade case, and I'm sure you did the Gade case, right? I, right where I, Illinois I, says, look, we're not trying to protect workers. Right. We're trying to protect the public. And the court says, yeah, sure you are. You're trying to protect workers with an OSHA preempted reg. So I think there's a factual dispute, dispute about whether the underlying state law in Altria had the purpose of protecting consumers from fraud or had the purpose of protecting health. That's a factual issue. Maybe the court got it wrong, maybe it got it right. But I think the underlying test is correct, and the underlying test will often prompt manufacturers to go to Washington to get preemption, which means getting a specific rule, which is a good thing. Thanks. Um, so here's the problem with uh, purpose-based um, uh, um, inquiry broadly defined. I think uh, the disagreement between Professors Vladek and Hills uh, just now uh, put the uh, fine point on it, right? Tort law wears at least two hats, right? Tort law is for the purpose of either compensation, some people like to talk about corrective justice, righting moral wrongs between individuals, et cetera, and or, you know, depending on who's the uh, person teaching you tort law, it's about regulation, right? So what we're talking about here, when we talk about implied, right, preemption, is where tort in its regulatory guise is going to abut the federal regulatory scheme. There will be individuals who suggest that notwithstanding the fact, and here I'm on all fours with uh, Professor Hills's point that in regulation, particularly of drug, failure to warn claims in the drug context, the standard of liability that states impose is a negligence inflected cost benefit analysis type test by and large. But imagine a state had a kind of no fault standard and wanted drug uh, manufacturers just to pay in a tax, et cetera, et cetera, there would be absolutely no conflict on this purpose view. And I think Professors Laddick and Hills disagree, just to be clear, on, on that. One, one other, actually, two but other points. I agree, points. no preemption. Okay. okay, so two other points, though. Um, I just think that's the debate, and it's fascinating. It's why, when in my remarks, when I said the Supreme Court does a lot of tort law, in this article that I wrote talking about the uh, whole array of products liability preemption cases, there's a section called the two faces of tort law. And by and large, the Supreme Court sometimes talks about uh, tort law as all about compensating injured plaintiffs. Oh, by the way, that's in the cases where they're finding against preemption. And the ones where they go towards preemption, tort law, the view of tort law, it's all about regulation. Well, in fact, you know, it's you, you have to have a coherent framework where we try to to tease out either looking at the actual standard of liability that's being used right in different contexts and maybe failure to warn claims in the drug context would be treated differently from some other uh, tort-based standard in another context. And I think that's actually very important. 
Second point um, on Altria that I want to make, um, and I think this, um, this also feeds in a little bit um, to the uh, politics point. So I'm certainly not naive as to the fact that politics plays a role in all of this. Of course, the business lobbies, if you look at the punitive damages jurisprudence, they were arguing vociferously and mounting their front before the U.S. Supreme Court got in on this game, mostly by invalidating the first state tort award, uh, punitive damages award in BMW versus Gore. So to my mind, as a legal academic, I'm not a political scientist. I don't have any expertise to assess the politics of the situation. I think it's interesting to look at the framework the U.S. Supreme Court itself built up in deciding why they had the right to intervene federally in an area that was historically state tort law. And I think they make the same kind of attempt in, in the preemption context. And I think it's interesting to tease out those um, kind of rationales. Altria, the point I want to make about Altria is interestingly, when we look at the implied preemption uh, part of the opinion, the court, right, go back, going back to the point that I started with about what the court does in these cases, comes to the anti-preemption position that was argued before it, right, by the Federal Trade Commission, via the Supreme Court, right? So the agency itself, for a lot of these reasons that people say an agency will always want to preempt, will never come in, even in a politically charged administration, the arguments were that its terrain, what the FTC does with respect to monitoring consumer fraud, et cetera, is so broad and they're not doing enforcement. They rely, their brief says, we rely on state enforcement to complement what we're doing. That's very different from what the FDA is saying. And it may be that agencies, their structures, their resources, their capabilities actually differ quite a lot. And under my model, those differences would be, uh, would be uh, very, very important. I just want, no, no, I just want to say with we, we, we are in a new regime, all right, and so I think what might happen with preemption is a big question mark now yeah, um, we with are, possible change of personnel on the court and through federal agencies. I hate to preempt the rest of the discussion because this was a great one. One of the things to think about on that, and, and maybe we can get to that in the next panel, is the significance of the decision last week to not preempt state environmental standards on auto emissions. Right. Mm -hmm. which is a massive, I mean, as, 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 as Linda pointed out, so much of what happened in the law of federal preemption followed the politics that came out of Bush Quayle and the effort there. Are we seeing an entirely new emphasis politically signaled by that decision that may lead to changing the laws further down the road as well as changing on agency positions on how much they want to preempt? <laughs> anyway, this was a great, exciting panel. We have more preemption to follow. Thank you. Let, let, let's all get together and thank the panel one more time. Thank <laughs> you.